um, hopefully you're, hopefully you've been, you've been enjoying been the session this session morning or afternoon or after your location. Uh, we're going to kick off our next session with Hugo Guerrero about hunting down the monsters hidden in your software supply chain. As a just a logistic reminder, any questions you have during the session, push them into the the comment section, and we'll try to fill those at the end of the session. So with that, I'll turn it over to Hugo. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk with you, uh, all of you, um, <clears throat> wherever you are and whatever the time it is. I uh, really um, <clears throat> hope you, you are enjoying your day and you're enjoying the session as and, and, and you know, overall the, the event. So uh, in the next minutes, we are going to be talking about um, software supply chain, and the different challenges and attacks that some of the monsters are uh, and that are stalking your your process. So um, I hope you enjoyed the session. And um, my name is Hugo. As I was mentioning, some introductions. We're part of the Red Hat team. That is part of what we used to call middleware now application developer BU that focuses on developer development productivity and uh, how we can um, enhance your developer experience within your organization, um, either by providing tooling, platform engineering solutions, as well as frameworks and software development uh, tooling. So in this uh, session, I'm gonna be focusing more on the uh, software supply. So let's get started with some of the, uh, of the data that we have uh, for this. Um, so, when we're talking about the monsters that we have on the software supply chain, um, it is not if they're gonna be able to attack or if they really exist. The problem is not that, it's really when that's gonna be happening, right? We know they exist, we know they're hunting there, we know that they're um, gonna be um, trying to stop you and being able to attack. So you, that's why you need to be prepared for that. And the thing is that um, with the uh, coming of um, an extended software development process in any single organization where we are just, you know, adding more and more software resources and software processes, the um, management of how that software is being provisioned, how that software is being created, how the software is going to be delivered to your web application, your desktop applications, or even your phone applications, means uh, that you need to take a special attention on how you're procuring that kind of software. And this is what we call the software supply chain, when we are um, aware that uh, not all the software that uh, ends in our site, in our uh, mobiles or in our uh, desktops, it's coming from our own developers. Uh, yes, we have some of the software being provided by, by, by them, but in, in reality, for developers to be productive, they need to be able to, you know, build on the foundations of more software. And most of the times that will be uh, perhaps other libraries from different teams, like if you are working on a big organization, um, <clears throat> you will have um, uh, other teams working on different parts of the, of the software, but also you will be relying on third-party software. It could be some software provided by your, um, your one of your vendors, uh, for example, um, some uh, software that comes out of the box or um, perhaps some libraries to access a specific type of, uh, of uh, middleware of, uh, or uh, resources that are available on your development platform. Um, but every single year we have more and more um, presence of open source solutions that are being available <clears throat> yeah, through Git repos, from package managers, and uh, those also provide by uh, third-party developers uh, where some of the times we don't have like a direct um, contract or uh, use uh, of, of those. And this is uh, some of the things we need to take in account because when there is no uh, strict relationship or the type of licenses is uh, as, as is, um, sometimes our software can be uh, one of the points of entry for, uh, for attackers, for these monsters to, to become present and, and show in our uh, in our um, in our backyard, so <clears throat> that's why we need to be able to to take some measures to be able to uh, work around these potential issues, these potential threats and attacks that uh, can become present at any time. 
And one of the things that we usually uh, try to do, it's first getting to the monster hunt hunter mindset. What it means is that, well, we know that monsters exist and that they are, you know, walking around and they are just waiting for a moment to be able to attack. So what you need to do is become this person that um, has the uh, capabilities and it has the, 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 the willing to be able to be aware of its environment, being able to gather some tools and some information about what are the potential threats and then being able to um, go and, and chase these monsters and, 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 and being able to hunt them. And if we think about the software supply chain, in overall the building uh, of software, um, DevSecOps is the practice that has been helping us to deal with this. Um, it is a change of culture. It is a, uh, it is a change in the paradigm of how we build software. And this is where things like shift left becomes critical to be able to detect threats and being able to stop potential uh, vulnerabilities before they move forward in the chain, right? So we start with building software um, and, and deploying and, 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 and running that in production. So every time that we are able to catch and kill one of these monsters in the early stages of the process, that makes our um, overall um, process uh, more secure. So yes, a lot of initiatives from uh, companies are on building these teams that, these ha that have this monster hunter mindset um, by putting together all the teams and all what we have built around DevOps with the addition of the security teams, involving uh, the security teams to be able to get um, into the same, um, in the same objectives, to be able to protect um, the, uh, the software at any of the uh, different stages um, of, of it. So uh, from hybrid cloud to microservices to any kind of development, it is important to make this, this change <clears throat> and be sure that even though um, security, it's, uh, it's something that used to be focuses in the past, in, in, in the latest stages, every time we, we uh, bring it uh, to the left, it's going to make it uh, more secure for our development. And then one of the things that we are um, uh, trying to figure out is, okay, I have this monster uh, hunter mindset. I know that I need to be able to um, be aware of my surroundings, have some toolings, but yeah, where do I look for this monster? Where, where uh, you should expect them to appear and being able to, you know, try to, to fight them back. So as I was saying um, on our supply chain that it's, uh, it, it has different stages and different phases. Um, in all of them, we are uh, there are different type of monsters that live in, in each one of those uh, steps and on those areas. So most of the times when um, when we see potential threats, when we see that uh, there's vulnerabilities, can be um, either in this or one of or on one of these three um, uh, phases of of the software development life cycle. Uh, could be when we are um, starting to code our application, when we are in the early stages of the process, perhaps doing some architecture, being able to throw the first lines of code, bring in the first uh, dependencies and libraries uh, that are coming um, for from repos. Then the uh, second phase is when we are actually building our systems and, and checking those. Um, so uh, code phase is the first, second one is when we are running our um, usually CI and, C and, and, uh, and integration uh, pipelines where we are building our software, when we are pulling together all dependencies, when we are um, uh, packaging artifacts that will, then will become our applications and will be deployed into our target environments. Finally, the third ecosystem where we usually see monsters uh, um, Stocking, it's uh, when we are actually during runtime, right? When we are deploying those artifacts, those applications, when we start to see that there's uh, misconfigurations of there's drift between configurations in our environments that allow to become uh, exploitable by, you know, um, by malicious actors. But also one of the th important things is that sometimes we just forget about the, uh, this kind of, uh, of threats. We feel very secure because during the process, we were able to clean up most of the uh, monsters that we were 
uh, finding. But then we forget about this and we uh, know that all software and the software that is not being uh, updated, it's also becoming a risk. So um, during runtime, is there also an area where you will find some of these kind of monsters that will be uh, uh, threatening your, um, your software supply chain. So let's uh, get a little bit uh, deeper on this kind of monster. So um, very similar to uh, the cards that we are able to share uh, for finding uh, some certain uh, monster, we can um, find uh, information on, on, on this kind of, uh, of monster. So the first one that I want to present is the uh, monster that we call the unverified changes to a git repo and this kind of monster his main attack it's when he is, tries to spoof a person's identity and want to impersonate someone and then commits code to a git repo and because most of the times when i see oh you know mike has uh, already committed some of the tickets and, and, and work on the tickets that he was working on I, I trust Mike because usually you know we know that that, that he is uh, one of the lead architects and even though it, it, the the commit looks a little bit you know odd I know that Mike's is always sending good code so that's why we uh, some of the times you know just neglect some of the security precautions or revisions on that kind of code so uh, this is how this kind of monster attacks right so when uh, you are able to, when they are, the, the threat is that they are able to then commit code that is not review and that it's, you know, um, skipping some of the, uh, of the reviews on, on, on your um, pull request process. So if you're a monster hunter, one of the actions that you can take is um, doing things uh, as easy as uh, signing your git commits. So if you're using something like git sign, you're able to uh, provide cryptographic keys that will help you um, verify the identity of the person that is signing those uh, those git commits. Um, in this case, we are, will um, you know assure that if 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 there uh, is a key that is very well protected, that the identity is secure, or we're using things like uh, tokens, we can then uh, be able to fight back this kind of monster. So this is one of the monsters. Another monster that I want to uh, to be aware of is the unreliable dependencies. So uh, this is a, a very common one. This is uh, found everywhere. And if you remember Log4j um, uh, issues in the past, you, you will certainly identify this kind of monster. And the problem of, of this monster is that he attacks with uh, dependencies that have security vulnerabilities. And mainly he hides on the complexity of the tree of those dependencies and mainly to the dependencies that are transient. When we explicitly, explicitly um, put some uh, dependencies on a, our pump XML files or our uh, package.json, we know exactly which versions are, and we can just you know run simple queries to be able to get that information. However, sometimes those dependencies have other dependencies that become transient, and then uh, transitive, and then um, we are not able to easily check which one of those dependencies are on uh, versions and releases that have some vulnerabilities. So to protect you and being able to hunt down this monster, I recommend you to use uh, trusted curated content. So be able to sh be sure that the content that you're pulling, the dependencies that you're pulling are being provided and they're being verified by, um, by your uh, procurement uh, process. Um, also being able to automate software composes, uh, composition analysis and dependency analytics. So being able to uh, uh, roll out and, and complete all that tree of dependencies and being able to review e each one of those. Um, also, it's, it's uh, something useful for you to kill this kind of monster to be able to um, have this sign and verify uh, artifacts that you know that uh, have not been tampered, have not been contaminated or been um, uh, a place where this monster can hide. And you will ask, well, what are the minimum requir requirements, right? So most of the times there's um, some processes and, and, and practice for compliance, but also there's um, some now uh, requirements as part of the specifications and, and regulatory um, uh, guidelines to be able to say, you know, that I trust this software or this source code. And this is where things like the software bill of materials, what we usually call S-bombs, 
uh, become um, some uh, of the tooling that we can uh, that can help us do at this to verify that the origin and the source of our code uh, it's uh, it's secure it's more secure so also we have um, uh, files to be able to handle vulnerability management uh, we also can do uh, software composition analysis as we are, as we were saying which parts of the software are being uh, collected. Uh, one of the tools that I really like it's uh, for dependency analytics, it's the Red Hat um, dependency analytics uh, plugin for VS Code, where you can just go over your POM file if you're doing Java, for example, and being able to run on-demand information on your dependencies, being able to show the information and how they are um, being uh, ranked. As you can see if there's like high risk, less risk on the information that is being provided by um, authorities like Red Hat. We are um, obviously building software and open source software that uh, needs to comply with uh, many of these uh, requirements. So uh, we know exactly we have a very huge uh, uh, catalog of uh, vulnerabilities and CVEs and information regarding where are certain uh, libraries standing in, in regards of security. So this is a very uh, useful tool. You, it's available from your own um, uh, IDE, but also you can get onto uh, cloud.redhat.com being able to uh, query that if you are coming from like the security team. More monsters that you need to be aware of. If you're doing containers, if you're doing OpenShift, one of the uh, most common monsters that you will find is the tampered containers. And this is um, this can be sometimes a malicious uh, actor being trying to, you know, uh, to pollute your uh, your containers. But actually, most of the times it's just outdated versions, right? So um, when you are building on top of certain container images, if you are, you know, just pulling them from the internet, and um, th th that could be something that it's, you know, being corrupted by, by some malicious ag agent, but most of the times they're just of the outdated versions. And the problem with outdated versions is because now the container has more information regarding on how the application is being executed, not just our artifact, but also information regarding the whole stack. This is where we can find things like um, operating, si operating system uh, package vulnerabilities very old versions of, uh, of OpenSSL or very old versions of uh, Node.js or the Java runtime that, um, that are being uh, used as, as part of the container for, for the runtime environment. And perhaps, yes, we build our artifacts using uh, trusted uh, software and running on, on secure machines, but suddenly when we are running those in, on outdated uh, uh, containers or containers that has, still have vulnerabilities, though, that becomes a, a threat that we need to be aware of. So how you can uh, take actions against this monster? Well, always try to do image scanning. So validate that your, uh, your container images are um, healthy. Uh, so things like, um, like uh, Quay.io is doing a scanning. Um, Docker Hub also has their scanner the, with, with Scout. And also check that their images can have signatures, so you can also sign these containers to be able to be sure that they are being uh, uh, checked. And there's the you know the information on 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 that. Also followed always compliance regulatory requirements. So we have been talking about a lot of signatures. So this is this is why it's important. It's a way to be able to have some kind of attestation of your software packages, right? So it's basically a way to say. Yes, this is the information, and, and this is like a, a, a key with, where we have been using to sign our content. So we can then avoid that somebody says, no, this is, this is not the version, or this is not the, the, uh, the artifact that I, that I created. So signatures are something important. And as I was saying, the vulnerability exploitable exchange documentation, it's also a way to get information about common CVEs, and other uh, requirements that, for example, as I was saying, Red Hat can provide you uh, for being able to track and check um, uh, how what, what are the kind of, what kind of level of of uh, potential uh, weaknesses do we have in our software. So um, having that information around it's important, but the most important thing is to be able to have them um, organized and being able to have that uh, in in a single place. And this is where 
the last place where monsters hide, it's uh, it's available. It's basically on, on the runtime side. So when we are already deploying and we want to be sure that we are going to be um, uh, be able to secure our software supply chain. So one of the things that uh, are also part of the software and someone's, sometimes it's a little bit neglected, it's the APIs. And this is where you have a monster, like a typical broken authentication authorization in APIs. An API, that the, uh, uh, this kind of monster attacks APIs when suddenly we build something that thought we were gonna be handling internally and then suddenly it's gonna be shared with partners, it's gonna be shared with third parties and, and, and final users. And then we realize that the API is exposing a wide attack surface on our, uh, on our information, right? We are exposing database, database internals, IDs for, uh, for our data, uh, or it's just simply, um, it just simply has the incorrect uh, uh, authentication mechanisms to be able to secure uh, some information. So OWASP 10 has, uh, has an updated version of uh, all the different risk of API. So the actions that you can take to try to kill this monster is to be able to, well, first uh, uh, try to implement your proper access control, being able to use roles and permissions, check that uh, nothing is uh, it's, uh, it's publicly available if it's not part of a role, um, obviously, check the uh, unpatched vulnerabilities of your uh, of your directories of where of the runtimes of your APIs as well as misconfigurations. This is a way to try to avoid and kill this kind of monster. And finally, uh, one of the other monsters that uh, that I need to make you aware of and prepare you to hunt it's the um, untracked and scattered security information. This is very common because we are suddenly resting and we didn't know that there's something on behind the, the, the bed. And this is because um, some of the, uh, of the, of the uh, products that, that, that we use, that we are deploying or software that we are running, it's, it has known vulnerabilities, but nobody's taking care of those. There's no remediation, there's no identification. And basically it's mostly because we have a, a lot of unpatched software. So, um, the best way for you to take actions on this is, well, being able to compile and put everything together and have a single source of truth of this information, being able to track the applications uh, that, has, that, that have exploitable vulnerabilities and being able to know exactly who is the owner, who is running that, who is building those applications and being able to track back to them and being able to help them out to correct uh, issues and obviously map the relations between your apps and open source code. If you're using open source, being able to see exactly where uh, all your developers are gathering those resources, being able to help them out to identify uh, potential threats that are um, need to be patched that need to be updated because of, of uh, the information that now you are getting just directly. And this is how we envision the overall process. Um, code build, monitor your trusted support, uh, software supply chain from the beginning where we have your applications, your language runtimes, uh, your container-based images, like universal-based image, um, you're able to secure the source of those uh, components where you're using the trusted content, where you're using signed images, then you can start building uh, your, um, your capabilities to kill these kind of monsters. When you're doing the coding, there's the tools like software composition analysis, signatures, when you're building the artifact process of building the Tecton pipelines or the Jenkins pipelines that you're using can benefit of checking signatures and being able to sign and generate SBOMs that will provide the manifest with the information and the metadata of how that artifact was built and then being able to provide them when you're running on, on, on your cluster to policies like using um, Red Hat um, Advanced Cluster Security where you can check if the signature of the artifact is not valid or is, is missing. You can then apply policies to avoid the risk of deploying that kind of artifacts into your cluster. And this interacts with other, uh, other areas like uh, your Git repo, your GitHub accounts, uh, with your uh, registry like Quay.io on top of any kind of, uh, of, work, uh, of uh, your workload uh, deployments. So, um, in sake of time, I just want to um, be able to invite you to uh, try our developer sandbox for Red Hat OpenShift. 
Uh, there's a new experience now there where you can get um, 30 days of, uh, of uh, self-service free um, uh, access to a OpenShift uh, Kubernetes cluster. So it's something really easy to go to, to do. You can just can go to that link. We'll uh, transfer you to the um, to the uh, up, uh, to the Red Hat uh, Cloud Console where you can try OpenShift. You can try develop uh, the uh, OpenShift Dev Spaces, or even you can try our OpenShift AI clusters. So thank you very much for the time. I really appreciate that you were able to hang on with me and. If there's any questions, we are happy to take any one of those. If not, remember that you can put it in the comments. We're hung, we're gonna be hanging around, so you're so we're gonna be able to uh, try to answer those offline if you don't want to uh, make any right now. Great, thanks, Ugo. Thanks, thanks, Ugo. Um, um, no questions, no questions in the Q&A here, Q &A so, here, so um, um, but as you said, we'll, said we'll the material will be eventually available on the YouTube channel, YouTube channel and if any and questions, any questions you can follow on, follow on they'll be hanging around, around the chat on the later, on the later sessions, sessions as well. As well. So, please so please join us over, please on, join the over on the main stage, stage at the top of the hour for our keynote with Red Hat and Intel, and we'll also be inviting our, inviting over our uh, or sorry, announcing the the winner of the uh, the hackathon recently as well. It has to have a really great uh, presentation to go with that in, in discussion of the uh, the winner there. So um, with that, we'll say thanks and and pop over to the to the main stage and then rejoin us after that for some more great presentations later today. Thanks a lot.